This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We are delighted that you are here worshiping with us online at Fenton First Presbyterian Church. We invite you at this moment to prepare your homes and your hearts for worship. Lay out a special tablecloth, settle in a special chair, find your Bible, and turn to Psalm 119. Find a a candle and light it. Find some decorations that will allow your home to be a reverent and holy place. Friends, we also want to remind you that we are monitoring the comments in the chats for prayer requests and other comments. We would be delighted to connect with you in that way. But for now, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Join me in our call to worship from Psalm 78, verses 1 to 4 and 12 to 16. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children, We will tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. In the sight of their ancestors, he worked marvels in the the land of Egypt and in the fields of Zoan. He divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the waters stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud and all night with a fiery light. He split rocks open in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. Our opening prayer. Lord of heaven and earth, we spend our days focused on so many things. Our work, our family, our friends and entertainment. Right now we come to worship and set those things aside. Help us to delight in the work of your hands, almighty creator. Fill our days with peace and grace that only you can provide. Pioneer of our faith, settle the unanswered questions in our mind, Holy Spirit, and renew our faithfulness. Amen. Joy 
joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away, giver of immortal gladness, fill us with all thy works with joy surround the earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around the center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea, chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Mortals join the happy chorus in which the morning stars began. Love divine is reigning over us, joining all in heaven's plan. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us sunward, a mother does not forsake her nursing child, so God will not abandon us, even in our weakness. In the hope of this promise, we can show God all of our faults, all of our failures, all of our wounds and our bruises. That's why we come to confess, because we know that unlike anyone else, God will not turn us away. Friends, will you join with me in the prayer of confession? Long-suffering Lord, we confess that in your... Long-suffering Lord, we confess that in our life of faith, our words of commitment have been many, but our deeds of love and obedience have been few. Like a mother who cannot forget her children, you keep drawing near to us and answering our cries for help, even though we forget our promises to be faithful to you. In your mercy, forgive the emptiness of our words. Enable us by your Holy Spirit to serve you faithfully, putting into practice the faith our lips profess through your Holy Son, who took upon himself the form of a servant, for our sake. Friends, let's pray silently. Brothers and sisters, will you join with me in this call and response declaration of pardon? Everyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Whatever is old is gone, new life has begun. Through Christ, our relationship with God has been restored. And our call is to restore our relationships with one another. Friends, believe the good news that comes from God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The prayer for illumination. Jesus, beloved Son of God, reveal yourself to us beneath the bright wings of the Holy Spirit. Dazzle us with your brightness, overshadow us with your glory. Speak to us. We are listening. Amen. A reading from the Old Testament from Psalms, chapter 119, verses 1 through 16. Happy are those whose way is blameless and walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. 
I will praise you with an upright heart. When I learn your righteous ordinances, I will observe your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. How can young people keep their way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Do not let me stray from your commandments. I treasure your word in my heart, so that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the ordinances of your mouth. I delight in the way of your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Reading from the New Testament, uh, from Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 12. They were very night the believers, sent Paul and Silas off to Berea, and when they arrived, they went to the Jewish synagogue. These Jews were more receptive than those of Thessalonica, for they welcomed the message very eagerly, and examined the scriptures every day to see whether these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, including not a few Greek women and men of high standing. We're continuing in our series today about discipleship. And if discipleship is about discovering who Jesus is, discovering what that gospel is for us specifically, and following Jesus, and being able to share with others in service and worship and word, then we have various tools in order to do that. 
quiet time we spoke about last week. This week we're talking about Bible study. Bible study is something that uh, can be a lot of different things, certainly, but it all includes studying the Bible, Scripture. And that could be done personally. It could be part of our quiet time that we spend with God on a regular basis. And that certainly, uh, we talked about last week, is, is important to focus and to bring up those spiritual topics. But Bible study is also something that certainly we do in, in a worship context and also that we do as a group. We gather together to study scripture and talk and learn from each other. But I want to just press a few things about uh, why study the Bible. First is we read in, in our New Testament lesson today about this, these people in Berea where they studied scripture and used it as a foundation for what Paul and his friends were saying. And then because those things coincided, then they believed. So scripture was a way to prove what Paul was speaking about and to increase their faith. They searched in scripture to find truth. And that certainly is a big part of why we would want to do Bible study. Scripture is a great anchor all Christians all over the world to some degree or another connect with scripture and so if we want to engage with other Christians and seek truth with each other coming around the Bible using this shared language of scripture the Old and New Testament we find truth and we can build each other up in the faith this is a remarkable thing and it's interesting too we read and this is a verse you might be familiar with in 2nd Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and 17 Paul speaking to Timothy his protege who is uh, serving churches while Paul is out uh, ministering Timothy certainly has studied under Paul but is now at in other churches and Paul says to Timothy all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. So certainly that speaks to why we might want to study Scripture individually and as a group, because one, it sets us straight in our thinking. It, it, it's an anchor in truth. It teaches us. It reproofs us. I uh, there's many times when I come to Scripture thinking one thing and realizing, oh, I was wrong. I need to rethink this because Scripture is is my anchor. And if it says something in here and I think something else, I need to allow my mind to be transformed. One last thing here, though, Paul is also speaking to Timothy about the Old Testament, all this stuff right here. Because at this time, Paul's writing this letter to Timothy. When he says scriptures, he means the Hebrew scriptures. And so that hits on a couple realities for us. So Presbyterians and Reformed folks have this concept that all scripture is God-breathed, which means that scripture doesn't contradict scripture. If we have uh, some question that comes up in the New Testament. We can read throughout Scripture to find what to find more context, more meaning behind this question that we have, and vice versa. The the concept being that all Scripture is God breathed really means that Scripture is a conduit for the Word of God. God speaks through Scripture, Old and New Testament to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that gives us this confidence that Scripture is the most consistent and concise and clear way to hear and begin to hear the voice of God. And that's why we study Scripture. As Presbyterians in the Reformed tradition, we look at Scripture, use all of our reasoning and thinking and, and, and strength of mind to look at scripture 
And then with our hearts and with our spirits, we listen to the Holy Spirit to help us interpret that scripture. And we can do that on an individual basis as well as uh, in groups, listening to what the Spirit says, Scripture says. A further reason why we would study Scripture is because Jesus did, and it's because the disciples did. I'll give you two examples. Jesus, uh, throughout his parables, throughout his uh, sermons, he is throwing Scripture left and right. It is obvious that Jesus is a rabbi, a teacher of the highest degree, knowledgeable about what the Hebrew scriptures say. He's memorized the Psalms. He is referencing all sorts of places in the law, in the prophets, in throughout scripture. So obviously he has done some profound study and knows what he's talking about. We should follow in Jesus' steps. Second example, I think most clearly, is in First and Second Peter, at least to me. I, a few years ago, did an in-depth study of both those books on a, on a personal level, and was, I shouldn't have been surprised. But it, but it shocked me that this fisherman, Peter, who, yes, chances are he had the, he had, uh, the letter written for him as he spoke, um, but he is quoting the Psalms throughout all his letters. In fact, there's very little commentary. It's all scripture that he just, he just pours out, giving it to the churches he's ministering to. That's profound to me because Peter studied scripture to such a degree that it was in his heart and he was able to speak it out. So we have these heroes of our faith, Jesus, Peter, among many others, who have found Bible study important. So what is Bible study? Uh, it's, I think there's two, two sides here, and I kind of mentioned it a little bit. The first is that it's using our, our reason and our minds to look at what has been written down. Jesus, let me be very clear, Jesus does not ask you to throw your mind away as you walk into the church. If I'm not making sense preaching in the pulpit, please come ask me. <laughs> please, I might be having a problem, I'm having trouble that day. But our faith should make sense to us. And certainly we might need to uh, might need to dig up some some expectations that are inappropriate or, or false. We might need to think about some presuppositions about what the world is and who God is, and those might need to be changed. But our faith should make sense. There's no reason why it can't be rational. And I believe my faith is very rational. And I try to look at scripture in that way. However, the other side is that if scripture is a conduit of communication from our Lord, then we need to expect that there's a spiritual side to our Bible study, that the Holy Spirit is speaking through the word of God written on the page. We have to not only prepare our minds Maybe if you have your, your Bible study, your personal Bible study early in the morning, you might need that cup of coffee to wake up. But you also need to have your heart prepared to be able to hear and understand, to be able to be humble enough to say, wow, um, that's cutting a little deep. I want to prayerfully consider this as opposed to say, well, mm, that doesn't apply to me. I'm, mm. You see what I mean? That we need to be mentally prepared, but also uh, our heart condition must be ready to, be, to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to us. So how do we do it? So I got some ideas. <laughs> this is coming from Greg Ogden's book on Disciple. And this is something that could be used uh, with a journal, looking at any, 
any Bible passage. Greg Ogden suggests three things. The first is to do, uh, well, the first thing he says is pray. Bathe your study in prayer. Open your time with, with God, praying to God that he might open your heart so that you might hear. But we read our scripture. Don't, don't bite off more than you can chew. But find, a, find an appropriate couple paragraphs or two or a, an entire story like a parable that Jesus shares. And Greg Ogden speaks about the first thing we want to do is observation. What's the, the, uh, the general narrative? The, the, what's the, what are themes that are happening? What, you know, who goes where? Who are the main characters? How are they described? Are the characters, um, how are they presented? What are their personalities? Are there any supernatural beings like angels or demons or other things going on here? Uh, are there any other human characters other than the main ones? And then what's the plot? What, 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 what is happening? Where's the action? What, what's going on in the conversation? Are there local customs being mentioned? Are there things that are, are there questions that come up about what, what is that? Why does that happen? And next question, where? So we got who, what, and where? Where is this happening? The question is when? When do these events occur? Are they in the Old Testament, in the New Testament? Um, you know, why, we, we hear the Christmas story. Why does, does Joseph take his, his, you know, his wife who's pregnant to Bethlehem? He just does? Did they do that back in the day? Just load up the donkey and take a cruise down down the, the Jordan River? No. There was a census. Caesar Augustus was, uh, was doing a census and finding out how many people he ruled in the entire empire. That, there's some deep context here. But it depends on when the action is happening. Why do the events occur? How do the events happen? Here's some more deeper context of just, but this is just really basic plot. And what, what's going on? Uh, what are the, the foundations of, of whatever story, whatever part of the scripture you're and Then the second portion, we have the you know, observation, dragging, uh, drawing observations out of our scripture reading of who, what, where, when, why, and how. Motivations of characters, even motivations of the writer but then we want to interpret it. What are certain terms? What does Sabbath mean? What does sacrifice mean? What does Jesus mean when he says, blessed be the, those who mourn? Are, are, are these words that we need to translate and have modern equivalents to? Uh, when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, does that make sense at all in our context? There's also figures of speech and, and other you know, similes, metaphors, puns. And one, one of the ways we can discover these things is by using different translations to try to see how these words might be translated differently. Because translation is, is an art. And there are layers upon layers of meanings. And not, it's, not, you know, it's not just one answer. Certainly, even in, if, if the English language is any rule, there's words that have more than one meaning. Different translations can help us with that. And we can dig into even, we can go deeper and deeper to find out what do these words mean, not only to the people who heard them originally, but then also what, so what can they mean to us? And then finally, any Bible study has to deal with application. What does this mean for you? If scripture is God speaking to us, this conduit of communication, then we have to be open to the possibility that God might be calling us to do something through our reading of Scripture. Chances are it might require something of us. Are you open for that? Are you ready for that? What kinds of thoughts uh, might need changing? What kind of um, motives and behaviors might change in your life? What sort of perspectives might mean need to be uh, refined? How, how does your mind need to be transformed? How does your heart need to be healed? 
This is the purpose of Bible study. Ultimately, is to change our lives, to find out who Jesus is, and to follow, and to develop what this gospel is to us. So therefore, every time we pick up scripture, we must expect <laughs> that there's going to be something that will be required of us, something that we might need to change, something that we might need to consider and, and really ponder on. So in closing, I want to look at Psalm 119. And specifically, you know, in verse 14, it, we read, I delight in the ways of your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes and I will not forget your word. Now, frankly, <laughs> as a younger Christian, I always thought that was a bit strange. Are, are, are we all supposed to be lawyers? You know, ultimately, the best Christians are lawyers delighting in statutes and laws. Uh, that didn't seem very attractive to me at all. But as we study Scripture, as we study all of Scripture, the, the exciting parts, the uplifting parts, even the difficult parts and the hard-to-bear parts, we find, ultimately, a God who loves, a God who's created everything that can be seen and is unseen, and a God who loves everything. And this love is found in, in the grace of Jesus Christ, in the promise of resurrection, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and even in the law of God in the Old Testament. And all of it, if studied, will produce a, a relationship with Jesus. It will allow us to know who our Lord is even more. And of course, that's the goal. So friends, thanks for listening. And God bless you. Our affirmation of faith from the Heidelberg Catechism. What is the aim of the 10th commandment? That not even the slightest desire or thought contrary to any one of God's commandments should ever arise in our hearts. Rather, with all our hearts, we should always hate sin and take pleasure in whatever is right. But can those converted to God obey these commandments perfectly? No. In this life, even the holiest have only a small beginning of this obedience. Nevertheless, with all seriousness of purpose, they do begin to live according to all, not only some, of God's commandments. Since no one in this life can obey the Ten Commandments perfectly, why does God want them preached so pointedly? First, so that the longer we live, the more we may come to know our sinfulness and the more eagerly look to Christ for forgiveness of sins and righteousness. Second, so that we may never stop striving and never stop praying to God for the grace of the Holy Spirit to be renewed more and more after God's image until after this life we reach our goal, perfection. Let us pray our prayers of the people. Lord, before we, your people, pray together, we pause for a moment to focus our hearts and minds on you. We pray to you now with honesty. God, we aren't always sure you hear us. We want so badly to understand you and your will, not only for us, but also for this world. God, what is in your plan? Why don't you give clear answers? How could we possibly be a part of your kingdom here on earth? We ask with boldness and pray for the patience to wait for answers. God, our hearts are overwhelmed. So many people we know are hurting. They need the healing we read about in the Bible. They wait in doctor's offices. They lie in hospital beds. They're in pain. They're isolated and afraid. They struggle with addiction, insecurity, and brokenness. They suffer from senseless 
violence and abuse. People across the world are arrested, beaten and killed. People in our neighborhoods are silently crying out their anguish. They don't know where to turn. God, why does this happen? How can this type of suffering continue? Why don't you step in these situations the way we want you to? In the silence, we lift up the names of those individuals who are on our hearts and minds. Lord, we pray to you now with hope. We have hope in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We have hope because our, your Son is working in and through each of us. We have hope in your forgiveness. God, remind us of our hope even in the midst of despair, heartbreak, and stressful situations. May we hold each other up, not only when we come together, but through daily reminders, prayers, and affirmations. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us made, us made real in Christ. May we embody Christ in all we do. Amen. And let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, God shows us mercy. How should we respond? By pouring out our lives recklessly, by following God into uncharted waters, by letting God shape us into something different from the world around us. This is what it means to be spiritual. This is what it means to worship. We offer ourselves to God. Let us close our worship by giving our gifts to the Lord. Join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. All-powerful God, use these gifts, use our lives, and use this faith community to further your reach and reign in a hungry and hurting world. May your power be at work in and through us so that we will do justice, love, mercy, and humbly serve others in our homes, in our streets, in marketplaces, in workplaces, Use us right here in our neighborhoods and beyond. Amen. As we leave this place of worship, remember to praise God. And also remember, praise is not just acknowledging God's goodness when things are going our way. Praise is also crying out when you are struggling. Because praise is an act of trust. Praise the Lord who watches over you now and forever. And may God watch over you. Hallelujah and amen.